Okay, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Robert Schur, Ben Janssen, and Jan Bart de Frede. Some thoughts about sustainable OER. It's all about ownership to continue our theme on sustainability. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, come to here. Come to there. Good morning, I will start. And after me, Robert will take over, and then the last one. The last, month, last man standing is uh, Jan Bart. <laughs> the three of us um, are active in the field of OER for some time. And it, some months ago, we sat together and asked the question, what about sustainability? Um, I'm glad that uh, the previous speakers have all already ta tackled this, this problem. We, we will do that from a different angle. Perhaps it's complementary. Um, we start with, this is our agenda for today. We start with giving a frame of reference, our departing from uh, experience and, and theory. And then we come up with the, the question of ownership. A, a question, uh, an issue um, in that in our opinion has to be tackled too. And then uh, we, uh, Robert will dwell on this aspect of ownership, and then uh, Jan Bart will present some details, some details about projects longer uh, enduring already in the Netherlands. So our frame of reference for the issues of sustainability and ownership consists of the following notions. The notions of David Wiley on sustainability. I will elaborate on that. OER as public goods, also developed by David Wiley. OER as common pool resources. resources. It's an idea of Olsen, Professor Olsen, and OER as digital commons. It is uh, an idea elaborated by Schophausen in, in her latest uh, Go, uh, PhD thesis for GoGN. Um, sustainability, we highlighted uh, the, the elements we think are vital in discussing sustainability. It's about enduring, it's about accomplishing goals, what are we doing for what and why, and longevity beyond the, the phase of projects initialization. Here we are, OER, in our opinion, are public goods, non-excludable and non-rivalrous. They are digital commons, meaning they are managed and maintained by a community of users and producers. And they are common pool resources, meaning goods that typically possess a natural or engineered, and I stress the term engineered, system of non-excludable resources. There are communities of users and producers involved. It is a process of commoning. And then we start with the elaboration of the question of ownership, Robert. Thank you, Ben. Um, well, the question of ownership, we have the, you have collections of open education resources. And as, uh, as, as uh, using the terms from the previous slides, the goal I, uh, about sustainable and uh, is this ongoing ability, this uh, ongoing ability that after the project has ended, the initial project, that you sustain uh, uh, realizing this enduring value. This so value continues, not only uh, uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for instance, the OERs you have created during the project phase. And ownership is taking this responsibility to create and sustain this enduring value. So, enter, okay. Um, no. Oh, this enter. <laughs> Well, about sustaining value, the, the term business models has already been mentioned. Uh, in, in, and in, in, in a later study in 2020, uh, Trilly and, uh, and others have uh, had done an, uh, an liter literature review about what business models are currently used in uh, actual 
OER pro uh, projects. And they came up with this uh, complete, uh, with this list of uh, models, and we will focus on the last one uh, named here, and those are those community-based model. Uh, and th there are some examples they use in their paper uh, to illustrate this, uh, this model. And actually, this last model, uh, community-based model, it is about ownership. Ownership beats finance in it. Uh, a, a feeling of ownership, people uh, taking responsibility to and feeling this ownership of educational resources is much, maybe much more important than the finance part. We don't want to say that financing is not important, uh, far from this, but this ownership is much more important. And I think Jan Bart will illustrate that in a, in a case he will present. And what is this community-based model? Well, uh, uh, we have here a, a, a couple of um, uh, characteristics of it. So it is the members of the community, they jointly take the responsibility for production and maintenance. It is the uh, variations, uh, there is a variation that you also give students uh, a part in it, and then you come at the co-creation part, as in the first example, uh, was, was uh, in the first uh, um, lecture in this uh, session was presented, uh, which we call under the umbrella of open pedagogy, uh, the student uh, connectedness. And uh, there's also non-financial incentives needed. And those non-financial incentives can be very broad. It can be also very personal. Uh, and uh, so, for instance, recognition is needed. Uh, the desire to see one's uh, own material improve effectively. Uh, I create a resource. I uh, put it on, uh, on, on, uh, in, a, in a pool of resources, but it has to be maintained, and it should have been maintained effectively and efficiently, and that, for me, could be the reason to share my resource, because I don't have the time to do that. Um, and a sustainable community. Uh, we use this model from uh, Buchel and Raup, uh, where, um, where, you see, where there actually are two dimensions to, this, uh, to, to uh, consider. You have the benefit level that can, could be at individual or at um, organizational uh, level, and you could have the uh, amount of managerial support. And for sustainability of community, it is important to be on the right side. And it could be that during the project, you start as an incubator, this business opportunity network. A lot of those initial OER projects are from that, uh, have this characteristic. We want to experiment with OERs, but during this project, it is important to shift to a best practice network. So uh, that, that, that this sharing of knowledge, which actually is done in uh, using uh, or reusing and sharing OER, uh, is, is uh, becoming an, uh, sustain, uh, institutionalized, and then uh, get the attention of management because then um, this um, uh, uh, well then you get this attention management and this will give you the managerial support which is needed to sustain uh, to get the, the right conditions to to uh, and and so it is the business opportunity network and the best practice network. Summarize. Uh, central here is ownership, and uh, all the things we, we have uh, uh, mentioned is put in this scheme. It is needed for the sustainable OER initiative. Uh, a professional community takes the ownership and uh, is a type of a business model. Uh, and there are conditions needed, and s some of those conditions are, uh, uh, are put in this. So, for instance, recognition is needed, uh, uh, the experiencing value, it should be a uh, failure experiencing both for management and both for the, uh, for the uh, participant to take this ownership. And Jan Bart will illustrate this with a case. Yeah, so all that remains is just putting all this into practice, which is obviously really easy. Um, <laughs> I do have enough time to elaborate, so that's good. Um, so I work for Kennisnet, which is the equivalent of SURF for primary, vocational, and secondary education. And we have a product called Wikivice, which basically is a platform for searching, sharing, and creating online content, uh, educational resources. Um, we have, at this point, more than 150,000 uh, creation, 150, creations on our online platform, the creation platform, and the rule is everything has to be shared CC by CC by SA. We have about six million visits per year directly to our platform, but because everything can be exported in EPUB, PDF, uh, IMS, QTI, whatever, there's a lot of local copies 
going around the learning environments which are much closer to the students and therefore can present the content in better ways. So we're, we're still trying to uncover one of our key success factors, like how much of that content is played elsewhere. Um, and we have our search engine is also a central search engine which runs the same uh, backend um, which is used for edu sources for the surf. So we have one, collect one large repository referatory with 80 plus collections. And everything is open license and available, at, including the software, but not really recommended to install that yourself. Now that the promo talk is done, giving you a little bit of context, how do we apply these concepts of ownerships to what we do at Wikiwise? We've been doing this for uh, almost 12 years. Um, for example, we facilitate communities. And the first thing we do is we talk to these communities about what is your definition of quality? Because every educator has their own definition of quality. One of the main reasons to start a community is to actually say, well, we think there's something missing in the current landscape, so we want to create something new. So we ask them to define, like, what is to you is a pearl, a diamond, what to you is a lemon, what is your quality of, your definition of quality. Step two, really dumb, really simple, create a homepage. Put photographs on there, allow people to see, this is my place, this is my place where my peers and me together work on our collection. That homepage links directly to a search subset, which is all the stuff that this community has created or has curated. Um, we make it possible to apply that quality definition with a certification system. It sounds very formal, but it's actually, it says recommended by. That means any learning material by any community can be recommended or certified by another community saying, okay, this is also matches our definition. So if you go into our homepage, into our subset, you'll find our a set of materials which we have either created ourselves, discovered ourselves, or certified ourselves. And it's all about them. Um, another simple example is we recognize creators and we recognize owners. Those are two different things because we also have, of course, the collection owners which are encouraged to share their materials. But we would also like to recognize the creators. A really simple example, I'm not sure how many of you still have contacts with primary schools, but in the Netherlands, primary schools have what we call a teacher room. And a teacher room is where the teachers hang out. This has got to be in every culture room. And complain about the students. Uh, or, sorry. <laughs> they talk about the great achievement of their students. Sorry, I misspoke there. Um, and what we do, we try and identify teachers who've created something nice. We call their, uh, the director of their school, the principal, and we tell them, we want to send a cake to that teacher's room. And the director goes, why? He's like, well, they made a really nice thing and we want everyone to recognize that. We want to sort of spotlight that. Almost every time that principal comes back and says, oh, we're really in for this, please send the cake on that date and I'll be sure to announce that we got the cake and I'll give a little speech. And within that school, that person all of a sudden is recognized for, oh, wow. Everybody thinks other colleagues would be like, did we get cake thanks to you? It's such a dumb example, but it really highlights them and it really puts them in the spotlight and recognize their work. These are all small things. We have thousands of these examples, I think, across the world, but we should be really practicing or exchanging these ideas as well. Um, another thing is we try to separate the metadata from the creation of the content itself. If you write content, it usually has a specific learning goal. But if another person looks at it, says, yeah, but you're really, this, this explanation about volcanoes is also applicable to this other uh, audience for this other goal. I can add a second record. We call that metadata plus, meta plus. We can add a record, making it part of my collection and making it findable under terms which my community will recognize. So these are all small examples of ways in which we feel that we want to create that ownership of not just the, the learning materials themselves, but also the metadata, but also all the aspects which go around that ownership, which give them credit or which promote their ownership of the entire concept. A good example, finally, is most of you have probably seen something called Wikipedia. It has an article which is written by a lot of different people. And all these people take credit and, okay, I feel partially responsible for this article. In education, in the Netherlands at least, it's slightly different. I would like to have my own lesson. So every lesson plan that's available, every OER that's available in VQIs, you can press the copy button, you'll immediately get your own copy, you can adjust it, you can feel ownership. With regards to the earlier speakers, you can actually say it's a sort of regenerative process because I take something that is 80% correct for my context, I adjust it, move on with it, 
And the next person can even copy that and move on with it. And we're thinking of ways to make those changes available back to the original author, like, oh, other people have changed your OER and have changed this, you might want to adopt those changes as well. You can also subscribe to changes from the original author and say, okay, changes that are made by the original author, I can either adopt those or I can ignore those. And those are all things like, this is my material, I need to teach with this, so therefore I need to feel ownership of this. Enough time for questions even. Wow. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question for Jan Bart. I think it's great that you're sending uh, cakes to uh, schools to reward teachers, but isn't it um, essentially a problem that you as a platform need to send cakes instead uh, and, and essentially tell the schools that their teachers are doing great work, right? So, so how in the long run do you feel like um, uh, this could be uh, uh, that, that, that schools can take ownership of, of rewarding the creators and owners within their schools. I think it's, a, it's an example of the, the dream of if you build it, they will come. I think we've all dealt with this. You build a platform, you hope people that will use it, and then you have a marketing problem because they either don't know about it or they think it, it's too hard or whatever. So it's just a marketing issue which we're trying to overcome on the short term by these kind of incentives, but in the long term, we can, see, we can already see a lot of schools banding together saying, oh, what we want to do is, is pool our resources and make complete learning lines for a whole year or whatever, and we'll invest teacher time. Because then it moves out of the, the sort of amateur circus to everyone, not being derogative about the amateurs, but if you have one person within the school, and he managed to spread that effect, and a lot more people get in, uh, infected by the bug and saying, oh, I want to do this, and they want to sort of curated collection, that's the point where you can start doing things like sending cakes or whatever. But it really is a marketing question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you very much.